Hello, everyone. This is Red Team Engagement, how to train your blue team to hunt adversaries. For this talk, we're going to be sharing some processes that will help mature and rigor, add rigor to both your red and blue teams, and especially equip your blue team to build better detections and effectively hunt adversaries. So first things first, just a little disclaimer here. The opinions, beliefs, and views expressed by the authors, that's us, um, of this presentation do not necessarily reflect the opinions, beliefs, and viewpoints of our employer. And with that out of the way, um, little introductions. Um, so I am Brad Richardson. I'm an offensive security engineer currently at Credit Karma. You see there on the left, I tweet at RichRJB. And you'll also see, uh, I like to write the occasional blog post and the occasional tool. So uh, you can find my articles on Medium. And a recent tool of mine is called Slackhound. It is a reconnaissance tool for Slack workspaces. Uh, so check that out. And now I'm going to uh, let one of my best buds and colleague introduce himself and walk you through the next few slides. Mato, take it away. Uh, thank you, Brad. Really appreciate it. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are watching this from. Uh, I'm Mato Bhatt, an offensive security engineer at Great Karma. On the left side, what you see is my Twitter handle. Uh, I occasionally blog on Medium. I sometimes write new tools. Uh, you can find uh, uh, those tools either on GitHub or on my Docker Hub, uh, uh, Desi Jarvis repo. And from time to time, you know, uh, so uh, <laughs> what I want to say is Atomic Red Team, if you're not familiar with it, uh, I have been using it for the last, you know, three or four years. I'm a huge fan. And recently, I have had the pleasure to contribute to Atomic Red Team. Uh, we'll talk about it uh, in the next slide about Atomic Red Team in, uh, in a little detail, but if you are not familiar with it, I'd highly recommend you check it out. So let's start this presentation with a fun brain teaser. Dexter Morgan, uh, is he an APT or does he work in IR? Uh, since I can't see the audience, I can't have you guys, have you, have you guys face the hands, so I'll give you my perspective. Uh, the way I see it is Dexter loves to do red teaming in his free time but he gets, gets his W2 for working in IR. So if you are familiar with the TV show, you would see that Dexter walks up to a crime scene, he looks at the blood spider pattern, uh, you know, deduce how the crime was committed, and uses the clues around uh, the crime scene to ultimately track down the attacker. So in one word, Dexter Morgan is an APT who works in IR. And that, you know, his passion about red teaming is what makes him really good at blue. And that is what we want from our blue team. Uh, our vision is to arm the defenders of the network with the capability that they can take an isolated alert, uh, investigate that alert to identify the chain of events as they may have happened, and ultimately track and flush the attacker out of the network. So if you want to use an example for it, for example, say the blue team receives a high fidelity past the hash detection. We want them to be able to identify whether that uh, pass the ha host that attempted past the hash was initial point of compromise. If it was not initial point of compromise, how did attack or laterally move to that host? And ultimately find the initial point of compromise, subsequent compromises, and flush the attacker out of the network. Obviously, uh, it's easier said than done. Uh, it is difficult, but definitely not impossible. So how do we achieve this vision? Well, uh, I'll use a little bit of soccer analogy. Uh, so if you want to play a 90 minute of soccer game, uh, you have to, the basic requirements are you have to be match fit and you have to practice the basic skills like dribbling, passing, shooting, and tackling. And then you know your coach will eventually make you play friendly games in the training sessions so you can prepare for the actual match next day. And that is how we have broken down our maturity process so uh, the four phases, detection chart, purple team exercise, adversary detection pipeline, and adversarial services lifecycle. The first three phases are supposed to uh, you know, make you match fit and help you practice the basic skills. 
And the adversarial services lifecycle is that friendly match between red and blue that is supposed to prepare blue for the actual match against actual hackers. So without a further ado, let's jump into phase one, detection chart. Uh, this is what it looks like. It looks like four different paint buckets uh, exploited on minor attack framework. Obviously, there is a method to the magnets. So what does detection chart? Well, detection chart shows you, you know, how good or bad you are at detecting TTPs on the scale of 0 to 3. So if we take an example of bits admin TTP, which is T1197, if you don't detect that TTP at all in your environment, then you give it a score of 0 color red. If you do detect that TTP, but not its variation, cert util is one of the variations. If you put carrots between B, I, T, S, it is possible your ADR tool or your AV can miss it. Uh, that is also one of the variation. So if you don't detect the variation, but the TTP itself, that's a score of one and color orange. If you do detect the TDP and its known variations, well, that's a score of two, color green. And obviously not all uh, techniques that the attacker use are going to be applicable to your environment. So that's a score of three, color gray. You can ignore building detection for that. Now, normally at this point, I'd tell you that you have to know your environment and combine it with your experience as a red teamer to prioritize the TTPs you want to test for because you can't do this for every single TTPs. There are hundreds of TTPs in minor attack framework. So uh, there, you know, if you go to uh, Red Canary GitHub repo, they have this tool called Gamify Attack. Uh, it's a great tool that you can use that, you know, you, what you'll do is you'll send a survey to your team bits and then combine the answer of the survey to prioritize the list of TTPs. So check it out if you have time. Uh, uh, you can use that to prioritize the list of TTPs you want to pull detection for or test for. Once you have a prioritized list of techniques that attacker use, uh, building detection chart is very straightforward. Uh, you're going to need following things first. Uh, you're going to need a Windows VM or a Linux VM with gold image. Uh, and if you can have a Mac with Mac VM with a gold image, that's great. Normally, that doesn't work. You probably need a MacBook for that. So normally, you'll end up with a Windows VM, Linux VM, and a MacBook with a gold image. Uh, once you get these machines set up, uh, you will pick a DTP from the prioritize list of DTPs. Go and gather unit tests for it. This is where Atomic Red Team comes in. Uh, you know, Atomic Red Team has some great tests that you, you can quickly, you know, test for and see if the detections work. But you also want to add your own test. You don't want to just rely on commodity test. So you'll gather unit test for those T that that DTP that you just picked, and then you run those DTPs on the gold image. If an alert is triggered, uh, you know, you rate between, uh, you, you validate whether the alert is triggered or not. And based on that, you rate it between zero to two. Now, one thing uh, I want to make very clear during this presentation is if you, uh, when we say the alert is triggered, we, or when we say detection, we mean an alert is triggered. So you can use alert and detection interchangeably. If you see the activity in the log, but alert is not triggered, we do not consider it a detection for the purpose of this presentation. So just a mental note, uh, you can swap alert and detection uh, whenever we'll be using it interchangeably. Once you go through this for each TTP in your list, you that will build a foundation for your purple beam exercise. However, right, before we move into the next phase, uh, I want to talk about a tool that I wrote, Detection Navigator. You can find it on my GitHub. Uh, I used to maintain detection chart in a spreadsheet. However, that's very cumbersome. And you know, if the new DTBs come out, MITRE changes the way they want to classify those te techniques. Uh, it's a big hassle. So I wrote a Django-based web server that you know can make this a little more seamless uh, and you know help you preserve your scoring. So uh, feel free to check it out uh, on my GitHub repo. I also have a blog post about it in the readme file uh, on how to use it. And as a bonus, I've included atomic test for uh, Linux and Mac OS. Uh, these are the automation script that you can refer to. And you can also add your own test to this automation script and run them. So at the end of this phase, you would have achieved following. One, you would have, ha have a prioritized list of TTPs. Uh, you would provide transparency to your leadership on how good or bad you are at detecting these techniques. And you would have performed the gap analysis that will help you, you know, 
direct your resources in a certain, you know, for, for certain detections, uh, response, visibility monitoring. And there's a bonus. If you do this, you can use the same method to evaluate ADR tools in-house. MITRE does it, you know, vendors have put their tools to MITRE for ADR evaluation. Uh, but if you do come, rock, come across an EDR tool for POC that is not evaluated by MITRE, you can use the same methodology. Uh, also, you know, maybe uh, you want to do, you, you still want to do an EDR evaluation despite MITRE scoring, because maybe the environment you're using is a different than the TTPs MITRE tested for. You can definitely use this method. Phase two, purple theme exercise. Now, we will not do a deep dive here, because uh, there are some great presentations out there uh, on how to do purple team exercise. For the purpose of this presentation, we would rather walk you through what it would look like if you do purple team exercise. But if you do want to do a deep dive, um, check out this presentation from Cedric Owens. Uh, you know, he speaks about how to do purple teaming in non-active directory environment, but you can translate it if you do have active directory environment. Uh, some of the methodology he talks about will overlap. So this is what the flow looks like for purple team exercise. Um, you pick a TTP you want to build detection for, and obviously you already have detection chart at this point. You know which TTPs you detect, which you don't. So you'll pick the TTP you want to build detection for. You did run the unit test in the last phase, so you would sort of have an idea of what kind of indicators are generated. Uh, they can be network level indicators, host level, or application level. Based on what level of indicators are generated, you'll be working with network engineer, uh, system administrator, or an application owner to have those uh, indicators logged to SIM. Once they are logged to SIM, you'll work with a SIM expert to build a SIM query. Then you'll test and review that SIM query. And we'll talk in detail about how to test and review it in the next phases. But for the purpose of this phase, let's just say that it meets your criteria for testing and reviewing. Then you can deploy the query and you just build a detection using purple team exercise. So let's make this more digestible using an example. And there is no better example to use than DC sync because it is an absolute worst nightmare for any company, absolute most favorite attack for any red team or out there. Uh, for those of you who have done DC sync on for on-prem uh, domain controller, uh, you would know that it generates IOC at host level and network level. So if we go back a little, we picked a TTP uh, on the left side, that is DC sync, and we identified the IOC as network and host level IOCs. So we'll work with network engineer and you know domain admin to have those IOCs locked to SIM. Then we'll build a SIM query to look for those indicators that are not coming from domain controller, because obviously domain controller legitimately do DC syncs. And we'll test and review the query, deploy it if it meets our standard, all right? Now, obviously, it is not as easy as I'm making it sound. You will run into challenges. And I'll talk about one challenge in each section. But depending on your environment, you'll have different challenges. So for example, for network level detection to work, you have to make sure that paths to your DC or all traffic to your domain controller, it goes through the IDS that will be sending you that log. Could be other network device. But for example, let's just say that it's the IDS that is going to send you those packets of DC sync. And at the host level, uh, every time your system administrator team add a new DC, you want to make sure that you update that SIM query to exclude the new DC. Otherwise, your blue team is going to be flooded with false positives. So you'll probably have to put a process in place that you know whenever a new DC is added, your system administrators notify your detection engineers, blue team, SOC, IR. So uh, depending on your environment, again, different challenges, and each DTP would have its own challenges. Uh, maybe for visibility, maybe for detection, maybe for response. And that is why building detections is very difficult. Uh, but if you do it right, it can give you a lot of mileage against threat actors. So at the end of this phase, you would achieve following. You would have improved detection capabilities. This is a recurring process to our detection. And all the process, all the phases we'll talk about are recurring phases. You'll just be visiting at a different point in time, depending on where you're at. Uh, this also focuses your, uh, forces your red team to improve. So your red team may not be able to use commodity TTPs anymore. They'll have to come up with their own. And as a bonus, this 
uh, exercise will provide insight into your tools. So for example, uh, say your IDS, which is sending the logs uh, for DC sync, cannot view those packets. That's a limitation. It means you are blind in that section. So next time you want to bind, next time you want to find a new IDS, you want to put it. In, you want to put it in a questionnaire for the binder. Uh, that hey, uh, does your IDS allow this uh, before buying the tool? So just a bonus, you know, it gives you how valuable the tools you bought are. Phase three, adversary detection pipeline. This phase can go parallel to purple team exercise. However, the main difference is the involvement of red team. Uh, red team would be heavily involved in purple team exercise, unless of course you have dedicated purple team engineers. Uh, then it's a different case. But uh, if your red team wears multiple hat, then uh, purple team exercise, red team is involved, uh, adversary detection pipeline, red team would be involved only in the review process, not as heavily involved as the purple team exercise. So this is what the workflow looks like. We already built the detection chart, uh, very important foundation for all these phases. Uh, the TDPs you wanna build detection for goes in the backlog then your detection engineer or a blue team member will be assigned a ticket, or they can pick a ticket they want to work on. It'll move to in progress. Then they'll identify what IOCs are generated for that TTP. And then they'll come up with the same query to find those IOCs. And once they feel confident, they'll go to a review board to you know uh, make, sh uh, make sure everything is in order before the detection is deployed. And this is the review section we're talking about from you know phase two diagram. Uh, we'll in the next slide we'll have we have questions on what those review questions can look like. But say if the review board accepts your content or detection or the sim query, uh, detection engineer's job is done. It will be deployed to sim, uh, and you know you just went through uh, adversary detection pipeline to build the detection. But if review board finds something is lacking, then they will, you know, give you the feedback. You'll have to go back, work on the feedback, and come back to the review committee. So again, no better way to explain this than to use an example. And yet, let's use a little bit different example this time. Let's try to detect that SSH password spread. So first, that TTP will go in the backlog. Now, say you got Sherlock Holmes on your blue team, right? Obviously, the best person to have on your blue team because he's the best investigator of all time. Sherlock gets assigned this ticket. Sherlock looks at this, uh, you know, DTP, and he's like, "Eh, this is easy. You know, generates a native level IOC, generates a host level IOC." And it, he, Sherlock comes up with this query you see on the right top side for network level, multiple SSH connection, different destination host, same source IP. For host level, multiple SSH fill logins, different username, same source IP. Uh, Sherlock builds a sim query that represents those two logics and goes to the review board. Now, these are the questions. Uh, these are the questions that Sherlock should have answers for when Sherlock goes to the review committee. One, is there a runbook for this alert? Meaning what step needs to be followed to investigate, uh, especially helpful for a junior analyst. What is the proposed maturity of the detection? Experimental or stable? If it is experimental, Sherlock, is, Sherlock will work those alerts until it becomes stable. Uh, the next two questions are related to not wasting blue team's time. How often will it fire? What is the false positive rate? And the last two question is where red team can chime in. Is there an alternate scenario that can trigger this alert? And is there a way this logic can be bypassed? So as for the alternate scenario, if you look at the network level logic, a simple NMAP scan for port 22 will trigger that alert. And when it comes to response, context is everything. Uh, for a response to an NMAP scan uh, versus response to password spray, for password spray, you want to start looking for successful logins, maybe not for an investor. So it's something to, important to remember. Context is crucial to response. And for the logic bypass, you will not always find a silver bullet for each and every single one of those TTPs. If you do, great. But if you don't, then you want to be aware of them so you can put some mitigating controls in place. Now, if the review committee finds all the answers to these questions satisfying, uh, you know, they'll hand this query over to the SIM expert. Obviously, you're not limited to these questions. You can add your own questions to this. These are just sample questions that you can have in your, in your review process. And once the SIM SME deploys the content, the sprint is complete. 
So at the end of this phase, uh, you would achieve agile content creation. Uh, I know I'm just throwing out big words out there, but it is indeed agile. Uh, it'll help you stay current with the threats. Uh, this makes your blue team self-sufficient. Obviously, when your red team resources are limited, you don't want to be relying on red team to build detection using purple team, because otherwise they'll become the bottleneck for you. And the most important part is the documented trail in ticket, uh, you know, enterprise ticketing software like ServiceNow and Jira, right? Uh, if the person who wrote the detection left the company, you have something to go back to and refer to on how the detection was written, or you want to modify that detection. Maybe you want to audit those detection. All those things, documented trail helps you with that. So you know, now we've you know done the basic training on how to shoot past tackle dribble, and we have become match fit. I'll uh, hand it over to Brad to talk about the friendly match between red and blue. Thanks, Mono. So what you see here is the adversarial services lifecycle. This is uh, how we envision it. So what you see is uh, the life cycle end to end. If you look to the left, we start with our planning phase and we finish ultimately on the right side by validating that we have both robust detection and a strong response. We'll talk more about each of these in later slides, but for now, keep in mind that the red team performs the exercise planning, helps train the blue team, test the detection and response controls during the execution phase, which we'll talk about, uh, helps with the AARs. AARs is uh, a military term. You can kind of think of it, if you're not familiar with this concept, as uh, somewhat of an improvement plan. Uh, and we'll show some examples of what that will look like. Um, and as well, we really believe that the red team has the opportunity uh, during the adversarial services lifecycle uh, to improve the overall security posture by driving remediation for all the great assessment findings that are gonna come out of your exercises, especially during the execution step. So let's talk a little bit about our prerequisites and our planning phase. Um, to us, a successful planning phase will really ensure a good red team exercise. It'll ensure your, your leadership sees a security value uh, with all the things that the team is doing, both red and blue, um, and it'll keep the red team ultimately out of legal trouble. And we'll talk a little bit about what I mean by that. Uh, on the left side of the slide, uh, you see things that we think are critical in uh, this phase, uh, and on the right side, you see examples. Uh, so let's uh, jump into what those look like. So again, to the left side, you see uh, during this phase, you want to define your objectives, definitely getting buy-in and support, understanding what's important to your executives and leadership is important when you go to uh, say, write your rules of engagement document. Um, and you'll be doing that, right? Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the sections that you for sure wanna have in your rules of engagement. Uh, ultimately, your rules of engagement, uh, you're going to run that by your legal team, ensure they understand what you'll be doing. They're gonna help keep you out of trouble, right? When you begin your exercise, you're gonna be able to focus on the exercise without really concerns of, uh, you know, are you breaking uh, some kind of legal uh, issue? Hopefully not the law, um, but your legal team will help guide you in all of that. And really important to be on the same page with them before you begin your exercise. You're gonna establish your timeline uh, for emulating the different phases of attack or whatever it is that you're doing during your simulation uh, or your emulation. Uh, establishing your timeline is gonna help you stay on track. Some people and teams will refer to it as uh, the concept of time boxing uh, your engagement. Uh, this you know, is a fancy term, uh, but it helps keep you moving through consistently uh, on track and the phases that you want to target, the things that you want to find during your engagement, during your exercise, the things that are important to you. Uh, so timeline we'll talk about, but that's very important. If you have the opportunity to establish a white cell, uh, this is a person or sub team that mediates between red and blue. They're really a facilitator. We'll talk a little bit more about that as well. Uh, as well as a green cell. So if you have the luxury of 
a dedicated green cell team or person, they will help you manage your red team infrastructure uh, and any other infrastructure that might be pertinent to uh, your exercise. Um, and then to us, in our opinion, we believe that it's important that if you're gonna be deploying any special infrastructure like C2, uh, to do it in this phase. And the reason being, once you get into your execution or um, down the road somewhere in your exercise, there'll be a trade-off if you need to go back and redeploy or to deploy, uh, again, even managing infrastructure, there's a trade-off. So if you're, especially if you're managing your own infrastructure as a red team, go ahead and do it in this phase. It will save you time and energy when the clock really starts during your execution of the engagement. So looking at the examples, just a little bit about what all those things mean. So your objectives defined by your executives or leadership team uh, could be that you are going to start from the outside and you're going to be checking if the attacker can exfil uh, data or whatever is important. Could be intellectual property, could be PII, um, whatever it might be that's important at your organization. Uh, determining your rules of engagement, again, you're going to be putting in what's uh, going to happen during your engagement, what your objectives are, what you'll do, what you won't do. So this might be like spear phishing everyone but executives. Um, you're going to be laying out your target network uh, and what to do if for some reason you need to stop the engagement. What would at least the high level procedures be? Maybe you find an active threat on the network, which will be really bad. Um, what do you do if that were to occur? Um, and then timeline. So you see here examples 8th of June to 14th of June. We're going to do an initial foothold. To do that, we're going to do spear phishing. And there's a physical pen test aspect to it that we want to include. For 15 to 21st of June, could be we're going to walk through persistence, data collection, discovery, credential access, and how we're going to do that. Uh, we won't go through all these examples, but you get the idea that laying this out ahead of time will save you energy and time when you get into that execution. So laying out a timeline, very important. So let's talk just a little bit about simulation versus emulation. We won't deep dive that. There are talks, courses on doing emulations. Uh, however, we think that there's a few things that we should leave you with uh, when we're talking about the differences. Uh, so when we're talking about simulation versus an emulation, you see there on the left, uh, this plays into our planning and execution phases. Uh, we may need to adjust uh, slightly our playbooks to accommodate these different uh, simulation versus emulation, especially TTPs, uh, and how we conduct those. So you see uh, for both simulation and emulation, these are objective-based assessments. Um, however, in a simulation, operators are using their own TTPs. Um, everything is pretty much on the table, uh, as long as it's spelled out in the ROE, or obviously uh, wouldn't be anything that was illegal, but for the most part, any TTP uh, that you would find in MITRE or it could be custom um, is on the table. Whereas with an emulation, you're emulating a specific threat actor. And in this case, uh, you're bound uh, more to emulate and mimic uh, their TTPs based on the threat intelligence or open source collection data that you have on that specific threat actor once you've chosen them uh, and who you want to mimic during your exercise. And for that, um, Attack Navigator is a great tool that can help you narrow down and answer some of the big questions about uh, what TTPs a specific threat actor will use and what specific threat actors might be relevant to my organization and company. So looking to the right, uh, just a little bit more on examples. So let's say with a simulation, uh, we're doing phishing attacks and lateral movement. That could be more generically. We're going to send phishing emails to employees. Uh, they're going to have malicious payloads in, the ma in macros, and that's how we will do that. Simulating a ransomware attack, again, more general, could be as simple as uh, dropping flags or commodity payloads on open SMB shares that we find, and then opening Notepad with just a fake ransomware message to the user to read. Whereas you see when we get into an emulation, 
we might be still doing the same activities, but they begin to look a lot more specific to actual threat actors. So what you might uh, see in that scenario is uh, you begin asking what threats target my company, um, you know, impact my industry, uh, where I have my headquarters, the company I operate from, uh, any partnerships that my company has, um, those things will be the basis of what a uh, potential threat actor would be that's targeting my company. And once we know that, we want to ask the question that's probably just as important is, do we have enough applicable TTPs for that threat actor to play out in, the, in our environment? So uh, the reason we call that out is if your environment is uh, heavy for a particular architecture, or let's say that there's none of that architecture, but this threat actor that you've chosen relies heavily, uh, the TTPs are impactful to that technology, which you don't have, might wanna take a step back and rethink, you know, is there uh, more data to be collected? Uh, do you have enough applicable TTPs that this is going to be a good exercise? Uh, if you were to say, well, I'm a political uh, campaign firm, I've chosen APT28, what would that look like? So would I have enough applicable TTPs? And so going forward with that knowledge and those considerations, uh, again, more specifically, uh, if I'm trying to gain initial access uh, and now I'm bound to say targeting IoT and VoIP or printers with default credentials, can I do that in my environment? If it were um, for lateral movement, maybe my threat actor being APT28 is known to do a lot of pass the hash. Does that work in my environment? And if I'm going to be maintaining access, um, can I do legitimate credentials? Probably so. These are things that I wanna keep in mind as I narrow down and limit the TTPs that I'm gonna be emulating during an emulation. Um, so we won't walk through all of these, but again, if we were talking about emulating ransomware versus a simulation, more specifically, what that would look like, maybe I'm gaining initial access and tying it to malicious emails, and I'm focused on the perimeter for a particular threat. And maintaining access could be tied to a very specific tool, like in the case with DarkSide, TeamViewer. So keeping those things in mind, looking at the differences between the simulation and emulation, these things that we specifically think it's important to call out and if you're going to be running an emulation, keep those things in mind when you uh, plan your exercise. So establishing the white cell. We won't talk too much about this, but we want you to know what it is if you're unfamiliar with the concept, as well as some practical things that we think are important. So uh, our white cell is our unbiased communications facilitator, and sometimes they're our referee. Now, hopefully in your organization, your red and blue team, uh, you don't have moments where it gets adversarial. Uh, that would be bad. Um, but if it did, YSL can often help as that unbiased referee um, in between both teams during the exercise. And it's another value that you get from the YSL. Um, just quickly, some key points. Um, they are facilitator. And a lot of times they facilitate a lot of important deconfliction information between both teams. We'll talk a little bit about what deconfliction means if you're unfamiliar with that concept. Um, but for now, know that they serve that important role. Uh, a lot of times, YSL will lead your outbriefs. Outbriefs uh, may be end of day, might be weekly between red and blue. That meeting might be even monthly. Whatever works in your organization, um, but White Cell often uh, in their capacity leads the out briefs. And uh, we want to note that identifying a White Cell uh, team member can be challenging. And the reason for that is because uh, if in your company you think that uh, White Cell or White Cell, the person uh, that wants to play this role, uh, expects maybe a couple hours a week where they're putting on this hat. Well, it's been our experience that White Cell is basically a full-time job while the execution and exercise is happening. So know that going in that if a person wants to play this role, but maybe only has a little bit of time in between, say their normal day job or meetings, it's probably not gonna be that effective. Um, 
However, um, remember too that if you can have a white cell member, uh, it's very valuable because otherwise uh, you're going to be trading, especially with your red team, time and energy. So we talked a little bit about the key points, just some additional goals and benefits. Deconfliction, this is really where uh, you don't want your blue team to mistake an alert for an actual attacker. Uh, maybe they think it's the red team um, and valuable time is lost. Uh, we don't want that to happen. Uh, we want the blue team to investigate, make um, accurate but fast conclusions, and ultimately relay that to our white cell for deconfliction. Is it the is it the red team? Is it not the red team? Do we need to focus uh, more on this than that? Um, this is an important thing to ensure um, the deconfliction of information happens. Um, exercise out briefs again. Uh, this could be daily or weekly in whatever works for your teams, um, but it's important to the exercise uh, to have that uh, cross flow of information. And then uh, again, white cell serves as that sanity check and sometimes referee between the two teams. And finally reporting, it's been our experience that white cell also, um, sometimes they remember things differently and more accurately than maybe red team did or blue team. Maybe red team doesn't quite remember, something gets missed from the log uh, white cell is another person uh, in, involved in the exercise that can say, no, no, it happened this way, or uh, what I wrote down was this. So reporting is another place where they can be really valuable. And so the green cell, uh, to, to us, uh, not too many teams uh, have this luxury, a team dedicated to managing red team or whatever infrastructure you might have in your environment. Um, but they play that part. So they manage uh, the red team, other uh, infrastructure related, uh, uh, infrastructure -related uh, systems. Um, they will be the administrator of any special software or hardware uh, that might be uh, used. Um, often the red team ends up managing their own infrastructure. Um, but again, um, there's a trade-off. If, uh, if there is no white cell or green cell. And in terms of goals and benefits, uh, resourcing and re resiliency, no different than any other IT system. If you have special infrastructure uh, involved in your exercise, a green cell uh, not only ensures that somebody's there to manage the systems, but they're available during the exercise. It's like any other outage uh, with IT. If your infrastructure goes down, it's going to impact the exercise, possibly the environment, could stop the exercise. And so if you happen to be on a cyber range um, or uh, a private range versus your production network, there's uh, trade-offs, obviously, to each one. Uh, we won't go into that, really. Um, but cyber ranges can be uh, really awesome. Uh, but they often require completely separate infrastructure. And if you have any special software like traffic generators, uh, things of those type for, that are especially useful in cyber ranges, this is where Green Cell really um, is helpful in managing all of that. So we'll talk about the execution in our AARs. Um, again, on the left side, you, you see our uh, key points. We think it's really important to strictly follow your rules of engagement always. Um, we also think it's important to call out that red team should not do anything that obstructs the blue team's ability to investigate. Uh, for example, turning off EDR tools, uh, things like that that could blind the blue team. Now I know that sometimes, especially in later when teams are very mature, there may be uh, times where you want to do cyber deception campaigns and things like that where you are actually obscuring maybe blue team's view, but most of the time uh, you don't want to do anything in your exercises that is going to hinder the blue team's ability to investigate and respond. And also for red team, if you're not getting caught easily, increase the level of noise at some point in your exercise. You can think about when the appropriate time is based on your operations, um, but increase the noise so blue team has the ability to uh, develop some IOCs to hunt you by. It's gonna make a better exercise for both teams. 
And so on the right side, again, examples. Um, we talked about uh, AAR as being a military concept, kind of like an improvement plan. This just lays out another piece of your reporting of what went well, what didn't go well, what can be improved, and how you want to plan for future success. It doesn't have to be uh, super verbose, but capturing these items will add, again, maturity and rigor to your exercises for both teams. So what you see on the right side for red, that might be that the redirectors that you deployed um, really helped obfuscate your C2 infrastructure from the blue team and made it more challenging for them and help the red team. So for blue, it might be correctly and quickly identifying uh, red team's SMB password sprays that led them to a compromised laptop on the network that was on a marketing segment, that maybe wasn't as protected as other segments. Uh, we won't go through all of these, um, but you get the idea of how you want to uh, develop your AAR uh, in all your exercises. So we'll talk a little bit about um, adversary uh, emulation again. Just some additional things that we want to leave you with. Um, again, it's a little um, uh, things that will be important, uh, especially uh, during your planning and execution. So again, uh, just some additional considerations. Uh, they may require more white carding uh, during your execution, especially, and that's okay. It's okay to use white cards. Make sure to log it into your report so that everybody knows why it was used. Um, and remember that not all TTPs will be applicable. Uh, some won't be stealthy. Some won't even be possible. So uh, you want to emulate a threat actor known to have the resources to do zero days. Um, not everybody can burn a zero day on a red team exercise. Most of us, I'd say, cannot. Um, that's all right, though. We can still have a productive exercise emulating or mimicking those TTPs um, of that threat actor. And remember, too, um, TTPs from a specific threat actor today have probably evolved. So even what we know about that threat actor and how they uh, work in environments during their operations has probably changed. They're probably not doing exactly the same thing. They're not using the exact same tools. That's okay. There's still value in doing uh, APT or red team uh, emulations, uh, but just keep those things in, in mind and how to still get that value. And sometimes it can be helpful to have an insider. Uh, sometimes this could be white cell. Um, it could be someone from your IT staff, um, but they will help you be able to emulate certain parts of your um, exercise that might not be possible otherwise. And you'll still, still be able to get uh, validity from those TTPs and be able to have uh, blue potentially detect and respond. And so keep that in mind as well. So remediation, we'll talk a little bit about remediation and how we see and break down remediation. We put it into two categories, uh, prevention and detection and response. So prevention is anything that denies, degrades or disrupts the attacker's tactics, costing them time and stealth. Uh, for detection and response, this is really anything that involves the collection monitoring for say a bypass of preventative controls, as well as things that cannot be prevented. Uh, not everything can be prevented, but usually everything can be detected. So just some examples of those for prevention, putting in place MFA, uh, putting in uh, additional network segmentation, maybe having a stronger password policy, all great preventative controls. And looking at the detection and response, so again, not everything can be prevented. Motto talked about DC sync. We may not be able to always prevent it, but if it happens, we can detect and we can have a robust response to that if the detection were to fire. And MFA is a great preventative control, but we all know that there are bypasses out there. Um, so what happens if MFA is bypassed? Can we detect it? And can we adequately respond to it? And of course, things that are very difficult in cases to be able to um, prevent and also difficult at times to detect and respond to would be uh, abusing legitimate user accounts or in cases of 
legitimate admin accounts. These are the things that we want to be able to detect abnormal activity or use of those accounts and be able to take uh, an effective response to it. So looking at this slide, we talked uh, earlier when we looked at this slide more to the left of our planning execution and AARs. Now we're gonna talk a little bit more about the reporting, the remediation, all the way over to uh, the right side where we're gonna have our blind test uh, for response. Um, so we'll be taking our TTPs used in the red team exercise. There you see in the execution step, those TTPs will be the basis of our unit tests and those will be used to build new or better detections. Whether our TTPs are mapped to say MITRE ATT&CK or if they're custom, um, custom TTPs really doesn't matter. Um, we will be able to take either path and our purple team exercises and detection pipeline process work for building and testing detections from either. So during our unit tests uh, for detection, uh, as a team, we will slow down. We will uh, be replaying the TTPs used in the red team engagement, and we're gonna validate uh, our expected alerts are triggered. And once we have high fidelity detections working, our red team will do that blind test using those TTPs to validate that we have an effective response. And last thing we want to know, that this is a great place to measure team improvement. We think about that as how much time did it take, say initially during our execution in our red team exercise uh, to detect something or if we didn't detect it all and to respond. And now uh, how much faster is that um, after our purple team steps? And this can really be the basis of showing improvement. And we'll talk a little bit about metrics and reporting. So. Uh, metrics and tools, metrics demonstrate, again, that improvement in that value. We think about important uh, metrics in terms of time. Time is a key metric, in our opinion. Time is money, whether you're an attacker or a defender. Uh, attackers want to orient to the environment faster than defenders, and defenders want to kick out uh, the attackers uh, from the environment faster than the attacker can achieve their objectives, right? So time is key. Uh, we won't deep dive uh, all of these tools uh, or even the metrics, but we want to leave you with some tools that we think are great and could be helpful for uh, doing metrics and reporting uh, when you do your exercises uh, and um, what comes out of those. So you see here again, key adversarial metrics could be like mean time to compromise, mean time for privilege escalation for red team, for blue team, could be mean time to detect, mean time to respond, and mean time for recovery. Some tools that will help you do that, you see uh, on the right side, uh, Detection Navigator, which Mata talked about. That can be uh, very useful that we found, uh, as well as MITRE ATT&CK Navigator. Uh, ATT&CK Navigator will also be useful in your emulation planning if you're doing one. And then also, uh, you can check out uh, Detect and Vector, uh, also some useful tools in this category. So uh, at the end of our adversarial services lifecycle, uh, it's going to provide feedback on all the great work uh, that was completed during phase one, two, and three. It's going to help train the blue team to engage, be able to track and be able to hunt for adversaries, whether it's the red team or an actual adversary. And our remediation phase uh, is going to ensure that improvements in prevention, detection, and response and our overall posture is improving. And of course, the strong preventions and detections are really the foundations of a strong response. Uh, you're going to be able to show progress and value um, by repeating uh, all of these phases, all these phases are recurring and um, they're gonna work for whatever type of exercise you are planning. So in closing, uh, again, we think that Blue Team uh, can use this training to proactively hunt. For example, 
uh, let's say that an exploit is released for a zero day. It doesn't really matter if it's a zero day uh, or a five day, whatever it might be. Blue Team's gonna be able to use this methodology to proactively hunt uh, with IOCs for a zero day exploit, um, whatever it might be, uh, and be able to build detections from the IOCs. Again, all phases are methodically linked. They're recurring and they provide you the basis uh, for continuous security posture improvement, especially around detection response. And importantly as well, it's gonna provide transparency to your leadership team. They're going to see the value of what their budgets are uh, doing. They're going to see all the great red team assessment findings, all the improvement with time and in, in regards to what comes out of your purple team exercises and all the great detections and response uh, that your team is improving with. And so they're gonna know again um, what they're getting for their money. Uh, the metrics, the documentation, the communication, all of these uh, coming out will be improved, especially around reporting and communication. This will build additional transparency so that your management teams understand all the great things that the teams are doing. So, and with that, we'd like to give a big thanks to everyone uh, for coming to hear our talk and especially to uh, Charlotte B-Sides for having us. And uh, we'll answer any questions uh, out there now.